What's going on guys? Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Amigos Code. In this video, I want to teach you about RabbitMQ. This video is part of the microservices series. So far, you've been learning about microservices, how to connect to each other, and you kind of have a good understanding on um, the microservice architecture. And currently, our application doesn't really cope with failures. And when, you know, other parties such as Twilio or Firebase are experiencing problems. So currently, you know, if there is a problem somewhere else, our application will fail altogether. So let me teach you about RabbitMQ. And next week, I'm also going to teach you how to uh, use Kafka. So this is something that you guys have been uh, asking for some time now. So today, you're going to learn about RabbitMQ. Next week, I'm going to teach you about Kafka. Before I continue, go ahead and literally take two seconds. I don't know why I keep on saying two seconds, but anyways, two seconds, smash that like button and comment down below. Literally just say anything, just say hi, or any video that you wanna see next, uh, or any questions that you might have. If you're not part of the Amigos Code community, go ahead and join both Discord as well as private Facebook group. And without further ado, let's go ahead and learn about RabbitMQ. So far, we have this implementation in here where we have the load balancer, customer, fraud, and also notification. Now, in here, we have got no asynchronous communication within these microservices. So fraud, nor customer to notification. Now, let's say that notification takes, let's say, 10 seconds to send a notification to our customers. Now, this means that from the time that clients are using our application, there will be a delay of 10 seconds in total, plus some milliseconds and whatnot, but in general, 10 seconds. Now, this is a very bad user experience. So maybe Twilio is having an incident or Firebase, they're having an incident and they can't really deliver messages for now and it's taking them 10 seconds. Now, you can see that we are depending on Twilio and or Firebase because this call right here from customer to notification, it doesn't have to be immediate. So it can have a delay, right? So whether the customer receives the notification or SMS after one second, two seconds, three seconds, one minute, it doesn't really matter. What matters is from the point that when the customer registers into our system, in here, customer talks to fraud. So this call right here cannot be asynchronous because we need to check whether it's a fraudster or not. If it's not, then this call right here indeed can be asynchronous because we don't depend uh, for any other checks to be performed. Currently, this is a problem that we need to solve. Even more, let's say that customer right here is sending lots of traffic and we only have one notification instance. Now, what happens if notification gets too busy? Well, the notification won't be able to handle the requests coming from customer nor from fraud. It's just going to be too much. Well, you might be wondering, okay, maybe we can add a second instance. So just like that. Well, it is fine, but again, still a problem because you don't know whether this will be enough. And the same, let's say that you kind of want to have 10 servers for notification. Now, this is not using resources correctly because one, it doesn't scale correctly and also things are not asynchronous. And even worse, let's say that we kind of need to perform an upgrade on notification. So we found a bug and in the meantime, a bunch of requests are coming through. Now, if notification, so in here, so if we get rid of notification, then it means that the entire call from here to customer fraud and in here notification, zero instances, this will fail. And at this point, 
we already registered the customer and the only thing that we need to do is just to send the notification but if notification is not up and running then the customer will be created and the response that the client will get is a 500 and you can see that this is not feasible right so this is pretty much what a message queue allows us to deal with next let me show you the example where we slow down notification and see what happens Within IntelliJ, I do have all of the microservices up and running. So if I click on run, you can see that I do have customer fraud as well as notification. Now let's send a request to the API gateway. And before the request reaches notification, let's stick a breakpoint in here. So notification is running in debug mode and I've got this breakpoint in here. So let's open up postman and in here we're going to send this payload to the api gateway which is listening in on port 8083 and from here you can see that this is very quick so it takes about 941 milliseconds um give or take right so this is when the request goes from one end to the other now if I send this request, so this actually took me to this breakpoint. And now let me go back yet to Postman and have a look. This request right here is hanging. Now, what I'm trying to simulate is the case where the request reached notification. And by the way, this is without the message queue right here so the request reached notification and now let's say that twilio is taking forever or firebase they are taking forever to process our notification now you can see that postman is actually hanging in here so it's saying send the request and it's waiting waiting and waiting forever now if i oops i was just going to basically uh, remove the breakpoint but I can see that this probably was a timeout and before I send the request so let me just go to uh, notification and in here let me just resume this and eventually it sends the notification but let me go back yet again and let me send so let me just wait for a second and you'll see that so let's just say that Twilio was having a bad day and they took some time to process the notification. Now it worked. Let's just resume back to Postman and have a look. 18 seconds to process our request, which is insane. So you can see that we have a bottleneck in here. Now within the Zipkin, you can see that in here, I do have the calls. So this one was the first one that took uh, some time. And then this one was the one that took 18 seconds. So if I click on the show in here, now I want you to check this out. So the request from the API gateway took 18 seconds. Customer made a request to fraud and have a look fraud you can see this line right here which is barely visible so this was super quick so if i try and click on that and have a look fraud controller and if you show all annotations you can see more information but this was really quick so this call right here was very quick and the problem really lies within notification which is taking 18 seconds have a look this line is actually all the way through the end so this is the bottleneck so you can see also why having zipkin is really important because we can visualize all of this stuff now this is when the message queue comes to rescue so at this point if we stick the request inside of the queue it returns an acknowledgement back to the sender in this case customer and then if notification is taking a while then basically we don't have to wait for 18 seconds as you've seen right because we know that eventually the notification will be processed 
So this is why we need to use a message queue. If you have any questions, please do let me know. Otherwise, let's move on. So when it comes to decouple microservices and provide a synchronicity between them, as well as resilience, there are a couple of big players in this field. One of them is Apache Kafka. Now Apache Kafka is open source and I believe it was initially developed by the guys at LinkedIn and it's basically used by a lot of companies. So it provides high throughput, it's scalable, one cool feature here is that it has permanent storage. So you can store streams of data safely in a distributed, durable, fault tolerant cluster in here. So something that RabbitMQ, for example, does not provide. Then it's also high available. So you can stretch clusters efficiently over availability zones or connect separate clusters across geographic regions. Now, Kafka on its own, it's a big, big beast, I have to admit. But still, I'm going to basically show you how you're going to use Kafka with Spring Boot at a later stage. Then what we have is RabbitMQ. So RabbitMQ is the most widely developed open source message broker. For this course, we're going to begin with RabbitMQ due to its simplicity of getting started, understanding its concept, and the integration with Spring Boot will be really straightforward, as you'll see. We also have Amazon SQS. So Amazon SQS stands for Simple Queue Service. It's a fully managed message queuing service that enables you to decouple and scale microservice distributed systems and serverless applications. So if you are deploying your applications to AWS, then this is a great solution because it's fully managed. Now, one disadvantage of using SQS is that let's say that you want to port your microservice architecture to Google Cloud. So recently, there were a couple of regions of AWS that were down, for example. Now, in this case, if you are deploying to multi-clouds, i.e. you're deploying to AWS as well as Azure and maybe Google Cloud, you know, let's say that you've managed to deploy to all those three at once, right? So it's, it's a very difficult job, I'm not gonna lie, but let's just say that you've managed to do it. Now, if you are tied to SQS, then you can't really move across any other cloud provider because SQS is AWS specific. Whereas maybe if you're running your own Kafka cluster or RabbitMQ, then you have more flexibility in here. So usually you'll see that you have teams that are dedicated for making sure that your cluster, i.e., you know, either using Kafka or RabbitMQ, that these are always up and running. Because again, if they go down, so in here, so if you lose your message queue, then you can see that again. So if this goes, then you have a big, big problem. But usually um, it shouldn't be a problem because when running Kafka or RabbitMQ, you want to run in uh, multi-AZ, for example, right? Multi-availability zone. So if one availability zone is down, then no matter what, you know, things are still up and running. So you'd never have one single uh, message queue for all of your microservices when running in production. And before I forget, I'm going to leave a link where you can learn more about the differences between Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ, and SQS, so that you have a better understanding of these tools. So you've seen why we need a message queue and AMQP stands for Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. And it's a protocol that enables conforming clients, applications to communicate with conforming messaging middleware brokers. 
Now, what are these brokers? Well, a broker, a broker receives messages from publishers, i.e. these are applications that publish messages and they're also known as producers and it routes them to consumers, i.e. other applications. So the broker receives messages from publishers and it routes them to consumers. Now, since this is a network protocol, the publishers, consumers, and the broker can all reside on different machines. So you can see how you can decouple your applications. So in here, you've seen that we have these microservices, they talk to each other, and currently, if customer sends a notification to the notification microservice, a notification is down, or notification is having trouble handling requests, then you can see that this can be a bottleneck for our application. And instead, what we do is we use RabbitMQ in this case. Now, I'm going to touch on RabbitMQ, but later you'll also see Kafka. And I don't want to go too much in detail about the difference between these two, but for now, let's just focus on RabbitMQ. Now, the broker is everything that resides within this rectangle in here. So the way it works is a fraud or customer, they want to send notifications to the notification microservice. They send a message and the message is pretty much the payload, right? So the JSON payload in our case. Now, this message here gets sent to the exchange and the exchange job is to route the messages to the according consumer. So in this case right here, you can see that this exchange forwards these messages coming from fraud as well as notification and then notification consumes the messages from this queue right here. So fraud customer are producers. The messages go through the exchange. The exchange routes to the queue. Inside here, this is the broker. And then outside, we have the consumer, which can be any microservice that is configured to pull messages from this queue. And with this architecture, we gain a ton. So one is loose coupling. So fraud, customer, notification, as well as the broker, they can live on separate machines. And since we are following the microservice architecture, this is actually loose coupling all of these services together. The other thing is performance. So we gain performance. Now, if notification is down, let's say that notification is down, right? So let's say that we don't have a consumer right here. Now, the cool thing is that fraud and customer, they can still send notifications. And at this point right here, the exchange right here receives and then puts it inside of the queue. Then once notification is back up, it pretty much just reads the messages that were hanging in the queue. And the benefit is that our clients don't even experience that notification was down. Also, we can start sending messages asynchronously. So if let's say Twilio is taking 20 seconds or more, it doesn't really matter because from our point of view, if any producer is able to publish messages to the exchange, then we are good. We can also scale in a way where if you need to run this as a cluster, two or more machines, you can absolutely do it and you should run multi-AZ whenever possible. Also, the benefit of using RabbitMQ is that it's language agnostic. So let's say that fraud right here, it's written in Java and notification is written in Golang, for example. So it doesn't really matter, right? Because all notification needs to do is to be able to pull messages and then transform the payload into whatever struct, for example, if you're using Golang, or if you want to use Python, then it basically takes the messages and transforms it in a way that it wants. Now, messages also, they don't get removed 
from the queue unless the consumer acknowledges that it has received the message, which is a good feature, right? So if notification has issues reading from the queue and the broker doesn't receive an acknowledgement, then the message is still intact. RabbitMQ also offers as a management UI, which you'll see in a second. And the community has built lots of plugins and you can run RabbitMQ on the cloud, which is a good thing, right? And you'll see how we're going to run RabbitMQ through Docker. And as you know, if you Dockerize your applications, then it's really easy for you to deploy on whatever cloud provider you, you want, whether it's AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Linode, and others. So this is pretty much how everything works. Next, I want to dive deeper into how producers are able to produce messages as well as the different types of exchanges. When producers want to send messages, these messages will first land inside of the exchange. The exchange then forwards the messages based on a routing pattern. Now, this is possible through the binding. The binding is what binds the exchange to a particular queue. So you can have as many queues as you want and you can have also as many exchanges as you want. But the thing is you can attach multiple queues to one exchange. Now, this exchange right here has different types. You can have a direct exchange, a fan out topic, headers, as well as one which is special to RabbitMQ and it's the default and it's known as the nameless exchange where the routing key is equal to the queue name. If I open up IntelliJ and in here, this is some configuration that you're going to learn in a second, but here I'm defining the exchange that I want. I'm defining the queue that I want and also the routing key. So here I'm saying internal notification routing key. So this is the internal exchange that I have. And I'm saying that if anything goes through with this key, then I want to route it to this notification queue. Then the producer on the other hand, all he has to do is send the payload to the exchange, providing the routing key. So providing the routing key. So providing the routing key, and this is configured through the binding to send to this particular queue. So since you saw some code, now this should make sense. When the producer sends a message to the direct exchange, which is this one right here, it means that the routing key as well as the binding, they have to be the same. So when they're the same, if you send a message, so let's say that we have a message. So let's just take this guy outside. For example, if you send a message, it will land into the exchange and from the exchange, it will land into, let's say this queue in here, right? So this is when the routing key is equal to the binding, then you can see that we have the fan out exchange, which means that if the producer sends a message, this message will be fanned out. So here it will be sent to all queues, just like that. It fans out the messages. So every queue will receive the exact same message. Then we have the topic exchange, and this is mainly for partial matches. So when you send a message, if the routing key is full dot bar and then the binding. So let's say that you have a binding in here and let me just add some text and this is full dot star. And when you send the message in here, you specify that you want to say full dot bar right here. So this is a partial match, right? So full dot bar matches this binding, 
Therefore, this message will be sent across in here. Then you have the header exchange, which uses the message header instead of the routing key. So obviously, this is a bigger decision that you need to make according to your needs. But this is pretty much how it works. And I actually almost forgot is that you have a special exchange, which is only specific to RabbitMQ, and it's the nameless exchange. And this is when the routing key is equals to the queue name. So if you have a message which has been sent and this message right here has the routing key as app B and then Q. So because we have a queue with this routing key, it gets sent to this queue right here. And to be honest, this is pretty much how everything works. Obviously, you can grab the diagrams so you can basically check for yourself. But if you have any questions, please do let me know. Otherwise, let's implement all of this. In order for us to have a RabbitMQ locally, let's use Docker. Open up your Docker Compose.yaml and within you can see that we have Postgres, we have PG admin, Zipkin. So right after it, let's just take this in here and let's just paste that in. And this will be RabbitMQ, just like that. Then for the image, RabbitMQ colon, and then let's just use the same version so that if we have any breaking changes, things will still work. So 3.9.11 dash and then management and then dash Alpine. So we get the smallest version for container name. This will be rabbit MQ for ports. We want to expose 56 and then 72. So 56, 72, the same on the other side. So the first port is the host and the second is the container. Now this port is what applications will be connecting to, i.e. microservices. So if we want to publish a message to a queue, we're going to use this port. Then we also want to expose the 15672 and this is the management port, just like that, so that we can use the management console. And to be honest, this is everything. And I've just noticed that this should be al and then pine. So al and then pine. Now let's open up our terminal. Make sure that you are within the working directory. So ls, you can see docker compose.yaml. Now type docker compose up dash and then d for detach. Press enter. And this now you can see that it pulled the image and it has started. So for you, if it doesn't pull as quick as mine is because I think my one was cached, but you can see that the rabbit MQ container is up and running. Now let's take this port. So 15, six, seven, two, and open up our web browser, say localhost colon and then 15 6 7 2 press enter and check this out so now the username for this is guest and the password is also guest press enter and i'm going to save this password and tada you can see that we have rabbit mq running locally now in here, there's a bunch of information. So you can see connections, you can see channels, exchanges. So I've explained about exchanges as well as queues. So if I click on exchanges, by default, we should see few exchanges right here with different types. So these are defaults and we don't have to worry about. And if I click on queues, so you can see that we have no queues so far. If you have any questions getting this far, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Okie dokie. I hope that you had fun learning about RabbitMQ. And if you want to learn how to pretty much just pull everything together 
uh, through the microservices that we've been building so far, go ahead and enroll on my course where it is still at discount price. And literally this is the last week before the price goes up. And um, yeah, I hope that you had fun. Next week, I'm going to teach you about Kafka. This is all for now, and I'll catch you in the next one. Assalamu alaikum.